here today, which is uh, awesome. It's great to see some visitors here today. And just to let you know, if you're visiting, I am not the regular preacher here. I am just filling in for Brother Brent Forsyth, who is our regular preacher, and he's on vacation. And uh, it's an honor here to go ahead and teach God's Word here today. So if you don't mind, start turning to John chapter 9. And some of you mature Christians, you know, that light's already going off. Jesus heals the blind man, John chapter 9. That's what our lesson is going to be in today. And we're in the midst of Jesus' ministry, and Jesus is in Jerusalem. And the re last reference that we have is why to Jesus is in Jerusalem is in John chapter 7, which I'll go ahead and read to you. In John 7, verses 2 and 3. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, was near. Therefore his brother said to him, Leave here and go into Judea, so that your disciples also may see your works, which you are doing. Okay? So Jesus kind of delayed, um, and his brothers kind of mocked him. And eventually he went down there to Judea and Jerusalem. And what John starts to record is that among the Jews that there is this division. Some people are seeing Jesus and some people aren't seeing him in a spiritual way and a non-spiritual way. And there's a division between them. And because of that, Jesus is, you know, talking in each kind of different conversations that um, some basic elements that, you know, he's from the Father. Jesus and he are the same. They are one. Jesus doesn't speak with, you know, on, on his own initiative. He's not here for his own initiative. He speaks what the Father tells him to speak. Jesus doesn't do his own deeds. Um, he does the deeds of the Father. He's not bearing witness of himself because he has others bearing witness for him. The gospel bears witness. The law bears witness. The Father bears witnesses through miracles, signs, and wonders of who Jesus is. And Jesus says that he is the source of light and talks about uh, a b bunch of different ways how he's the, the source of light. Okay, And that's what kind of causes the division between these Jews um, with Jesus. And he also talks about how he's the water of life. He's the good shepherd. He's the door that leads to life, and many other uh, analogies. So he continues to be in Jerusalem, and he's teaching in Jerusalem, and that's where we get to John chapter 9. And Jesus finds a blind man, and we're not exactly sure where he finds him, but he is begging, so that does give us an idea of where he is. Okay, and. We'll go ahead and start reading John chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. As he, Jesus, passed by, he saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Okay? So a few things here. They're walking, and you might remember just prior to this, okay, if you back up just a tad, at the very end, of chapter 8 Jesus said to him truly truly I say to you before Abraham I was before Abraham was born I am therefore they picked up stones to throw at him but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple okay so they're very upset with Jesus right now at this time okay and he he walks by this blind man somewhere by the temple and his disciples point out this blind man. And we don't know prior to this that if they were having a discussion about this man before or about those who are born blind or not. 
But anyways, they point it out and say, Rabbi, you know. So they ask Jesus a question, you know. And this, this is probably the biggest question people will ever have, okay. And it's probably the leading reason why people say they don't believe in God. We've all probably heard this. Is they say bad things happen to good people. The blind man was born blind and he didn't do anything wrong. Why was he born blind? That's a bad thing happening to an innocent baby like that. There must be no God there. We've all heard that and unfortunately, sadly to say, the people asking that question or coming to that conclusion are people who don't understand God. And people who don't know God or respect God or learn his word in the right proper manner and context, okay, they, they get it all wrong. They get the wrong answer, okay? So this was a question that even the ancients had back in the day. They found an answer, but unfortunately it was wrong. They thought if we, if we do something bad, then you sin. You know, they said bad bad things happen to good people because they sin. They're not good people. And that's what I mean by this. Is if bad things happen to you, then you're a bad person and you're hiding something from God. And God found you out and God is punishing you through infirmities. Okay? You did a bad deed, so God is punishing you. Hence, you know, you're blind, or you're, you're lame, or you're a leper, okay? So whenever something bad like this ever happens, they, they always have to question, you know, they must have sinned, okay? And this concept goes back as far as Job, okay? Which many place Job back in the time of Abraham, okay? So very, very ancient text. And even bad people who look good, or good people that are obviously bad, okay, that's what Job was bombarded with. They thought Job was a bad person. Well, no, this doesn't happen to just anyone. It's, it's, it's a terrible thing, and that happened to you because you sinned. You have these illnesses and infirmities. You're blind because you sinned, okay? Uh, the way you should deal with that is just, you know, repent back then. You know, you have this illness, you're a sickness, you're in sickness. Just repent, admit it to God, and he'll forgive it. And Job says, no, you're wrong. You know, that's not, that's not, what, that, that's not what's happening here, okay? I'm not a sinner, and God is not punishing me for my bad deeds, okay? So in John 9, uh, they ask, interestingly, who sinned, this man or his parents, okay, because he was born blind. And as you look at this, obviously they bring the parents into this question, okay, as part of the possibility on why that man was born blind. So why would they bring the parents into the question? Why would that make sense? Because when you are a child, you don't sin. You don't even have time to sin, okay? And you don't even have a chance to sin. So maybe this is a punishment to the parents for their sins. The parents are sinners, so God made their son blind. Okay? Well, the problem with that is that the Bible makes it very, very clear that God doesn't punish the sons for the sins of the father or mothers. Okay? They don't punish the kids. For the sins of the parents, okay? Uh, people's guilt, people's sins don't transfer over. And there are several passages in the Bible that say that. that that's not the way that happens, okay? So then in John 9, they bring up the idea that maybe the blind man sinned and therefore he was born blind, okay? So the question was who sinned, the parents or this blind man? So they asked if the blind man sinned, but well, if he was born blind because he sinned, then what you have here, well, you have God punishing the blind man before the fact, knowing that at some point that he's going to sin. So you have this pre-punishment of a future sin that he's going to commit, 
okay? And so in their mind, that because bad things happen to bad people, those are the two options in the disciples' minds as they're asking Jesus this uh, question, okay? The parents or the blind man sinned and God punished him and made him blind. None of that is correct, okay? There are a number of reasons bad things happen to bad people, okay? Sometimes it's, you know, because good people do bad things. And that's the consequences of their bad deeds. And sometimes people are in the wrong place at the wrong time. And sometimes people go and do things where, you know, God never told them to go and do that. And they get hurt or sick in doing it. That's just, you know, how it happens, okay? So God never guaranteed anyone that he would keep them out of harm and never let bad things happen to them, okay? Yet some people think that when we teach that God is all powerful and all loving, which he is, but then uh, then that's what God has done. You know, he is, uh, you know, punished them and he's not good and evil, unbelievers will say, you know. So God never said that, okay? In fact, the Bible teaches us that sometimes God will let bad things happen to good people, okay? And good could come out of that, okay? So God is the key person that can bring good out of bad things. So, for example, in the book of Acts, when Saul was persecuting the church, okay, in Jerusalem, what happened? Well, that was a terrible thing. Christians were being murdered, persecuted, um, beaten. You know, they were treated as scum, uh, scum of the world. But God made good out of that because Christians scattered and proclaiming the good news. Okay, that was something good that came out of it. The church started growing. It was a small mustard seed and it grew up into a giant kingdom, okay? And also, how did those Christians travel out of Jerusalem? They used the roads that the Romans built. Rome, the Roman Caesar was very evil and bad, but they built the roads and we were able to spread the gospel through those roads. So bad things good things can come out of bad things and that's through God's uh, providence okay so they asked Jesus this question who sinned the man or this parents okay so now that we got that covered on what they were thinking in their mind why they're asking this question to their rabbi their teacher who's the master teacher and Jesus answers and Jesus doesn't get into the point well what I just said right now, Jesus doesn't start telling them, well, it doesn't work that way, guys. You know, listen here, uh, the point is, da, da, da. I did all that for you guys right now, okay? So Jesus goes in and just starts simply answering them, okay? And Jesus says, neither one, neither one of them, okay? But he leaves that door open, okay? He was actually born for this, he was born blind for this very moment, Jesus says. He was born blind for this day so you can see the works of God. Jesus gets into this discussion about the works of God, okay? And we have one of these things that Jesus uses in his teaching. He always, you know, uh, often says, you know, I have other work to do. I have more important work to do, okay? You know, Jesus, uh, you know, they tell Jesus to eat something. But Jesus says, no, I have work to do and I have bread that you don't know about. Okay? So this is very much when Jesus talks about that. He says, I must work the works of the one who sent me. In uh, verse 4. Okay? Jesus is basically saying that they are going to see a part of that work right now with the blind man. That's why this man was born blind, so you can see me do the works of the Father. And back in chapter 1, verse 5, while uh, in John, in uh, the Gospel of John's writing, in chapter 1, you know, while uh, Jesus is basically saying, while I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world, confirming what John wrote in chapter 1. Okay? So that's what, that's, uh, 
That's what started this whole beginning of the light. Okay? So there are so many things that Jesus can talk about right here. Okay? He could, you know, he could say, I'm the, uh, the water of life. Uh, he could say, I'm the good shepherd right in front of the blind man and his disciples. I'm, I'm the bread of life. All those uh, analogies, okay? But Jesus is using the analogy of, I am the light of the world. Why is he using the light of the world now? Why not the bread, the shepherd, the water, etc., okay? Because the blind man is in darkness. And who's the light of the world? Jesus, all day long. So that's why he's using the analogy of the light, okay? The man is in darkness, and this is a spiritual lesson from moving on. We're going to be talking about spiritual blindness, okay? This man is in physical darkness. He was born blind. But if Jesus can bring physical light to this man's eyes, then Jesus can bring light to the spiritual darkness of this world. Jesus sets all of this up with the apostles, okay? Now he goes up to this man, and we don't know if the blind man heard all of this. But when you're blind, your, your senses are heightened. So I'm guessing the blind man was hearing all this, okay? And I picture Jesus kind of walking over to the guy and basically saying, I am the light of the world, as he's approaching this man. And he's a beggar, you can hear. So I'm, I'm guessing he hears this, okay? So now let's read verses 6 through 12. And when he had said this, he spat on the ground. Jesus spat on the ground and made clay of spittle, and applied the clay to his eyes, and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed, and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, Is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, This is not he. Still others were saying, no, but it's like him. He kept saying, the blind man kept saying, I am the one. So they were saying to him, how then are your eyes open? He answered, the man is called Jesus, made clay and anointed my eyes and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And I washed. I washed and I came back seeing. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know where he is. So it's interesting because Jesus has a different way to heal people, okay? Almost all of the healing is immediate, okay? But not here. Jesus could have healed him just like that, but he doesn't. He spits on the ground, makes mud, and puts it on the guy's eyes, and then makes him go do something. And we have a very similar parallel story to the story in 2 Kings 5, uh, chapter 5, with Naaman, okay? And Naaman was a leper, and God, through Elijah, told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam seven times to be healed, okay? And God could have told Elijah, just touch the guy and heal him. But God gave Naaman a job to do. So for some reason, Jesus chooses to do that to the blind man. He could, uh, you know, I'll heal you, but you got to do something. You got to go to the pool of Siloam. Okay? Now let's think about that. Some people might think that's a little cruel, a little, a little sick joke of Jesus. Well, what do you mean? Jesus is healing, and that's a really nice thing to do. Well, why would you go tell a blind man to go somewhere? He's blind. Some people are going to say, well, how is he going to get there? You know, the pool of Siloam. I personally think he, he would have gotten around just fine. You know, he was a beggar in Jerusalem. He knew the street corners. He could go to a corner and yell out, what, what corner am I at? Where am I? Neighbors were telling him where he's at. So I think he could have gotten around pretty good. And prior to this, prior to this chapter, okay, Jesus, in one of Jesus' teaching and his ministry, 
In uh, chapter 7, verse 37, I'll go ahead and read that to you. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from this, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living waters. Okay? So Jesus talks about living waters right here. And there was a ceremony. Okay? And on the last day of that feast and that ceremony, they would go down to the pool of Siloam, get water, and pour it out. So it's, 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 it's interesting that Jesus seems to draw upon that. And now, as if making this, he's recreating this ceremony with this blind man. You know, go and do what they would do at the last day of the feast. Go to the pool Sloan and wash. Okay? But if, or instead of pouring, you know, the man washes. Okay? And he's he's made well again. So the man finds his way to the pool and washes himself. And he doesn't think about it. He doesn't fight Jesus or ask Jesus why or what are you talking about? Who are you, the stranger? You just spit on the ground and rub mud all over my eyes. He doesn't mention any of that, okay? And like I said, your senses are, are heightened. So you, you hear Jesus spitting on the ground right in front of you, and now he's putting your spit on your eyes, and he doesn't even question it. I would have. So he goes and washes and comes back. And, uh, but he comes back probably to thank Jesus. Okay, we all know if, you, if someone cured you, you're going to be coming back. And then comes the debate. Here comes the debate and the confusion with the blind man. Some people say that is him. Some people are saying, no, that's not the blind man. It's just like him. It looks like him. Okay, and the blind man says, no, come on, guys. Come on. You see me here every day begging. It's me. I'm the blind guy. I can see. And they're probably going like this, how many fingers am I holding up? They're like, well, he can really see, okay? But some people aren't listening. And the blind man, in a way, becomes kind of like Jesus, where people aren't believing Jesus. And Jesus is kind of saying, come on, I am the Christ. How do you not see this, guys? Are you guys blind? Look at my works. The blind guy is saying, it's me, look at me, I can see. How do you not see this? No, you look like him, okay? So, we can see the analogy of the blind man and the Jesus here, okay? So, in a sense, he's still in the dark, the blind man, because he can't find Jesus, okay? So, it doesn't matter if he can see. It's all, he just wants to find, find Jesus right now, okay? So, he doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know where the light went. Where's the light, the blind man? He can see, but where's Jesus? Where's the light? So, verses 13 through 17. Now they brought the, now they, they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now it was the Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes and washed and I see therefore some of the Pharisees were saying this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath but others were saying how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs and there was a division among them so they said to the blind man again what do you say about him since he opened your eyes and the blind man said he is a prophet so they bring him to the Pharisees, okay? And this is when you begin to see the ironic twist of the story, okay? Because we're going to see that the Pharisees become the blind man. Even though the man was born blind, he can see. And by that, we mean he can see Jesus. This is all a spiritual lesson, okay? Follow. The man isn't trying to figure out whether if he was healed on the Sabbath or not, okay? He doesn't care if he was on the Sabbath or not. He was blind and now he can see, okay? So here comes the Pharisees, and what we're going to find out is that they're both blind and mute, okay? 
and they're trying to get something from the blind man, but he's not giving them anything to go off of, okay? The blind man isn't telling them what they want to hear. And he keeps asking him, well, how are you healed? How did you get healed? And the man keeps telling them, he made clay, put it on my eyes, and told me to go wash. And the fear of Pharisees are like, no! Stop saying that. You can't be. So what is the stumbling block for the Pharisees? Why can't they see this miraculous thing that just happened in front of them? They refuse to see it, okay? And they refuse to admit that Jesus is the Messiah and he is performing signs that come from God, okay? And then the answer is that Jesus is breaking their laws, the Pharisees' laws that they're making up that you can't heal on the Sabbath, okay? So that's what they're getting angry about. Now, there's this one thing right here in John, Ch uh, John chapter 10, I'm gonna read. John 10, 37 and through 39. If I don't do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, Believe the works, so that you may know and understand the Father is in me, and I in the Father. Therefore they were seeking again to seize him, and to elude him, and he eluded their grasps. Okay? So Jesus understands that so many of these Pharisees just won't believe in him, won't believe in his miracles, because they are all caught up that he healed on the Sabbath. And he upset the Pharisees because of the rules that they were thinking about. Okay, their mind, the Pharisees' minds were all on their rules. Okay, so in a sense, Jesus says, I get that. We get that. And us Christians are like that too when we spread the gospel, you know, to other uh, denominations or non believers. You know, we're going to preach the word, and we get that. Some aren't going to believe. Some didn't get that with Jesus, so don't get too down on yourself, you know. It happened to Jesus, it's going to happen to us, okay? So that's a stumbling block right there. They can't get past that Jesus broke their rules. And a miracle just happened. They won't look at that, okay? So let's read. Uh... Oh, and also, remember when John the baptizer sent his disciples to Jesus to ask if he really is the one that was coming. And what did Jesus say to his disciples? We'll go back to John and report what you see here. What do you see here? These are miracles, works from God, from heaven. Go report them. So the gospel isn't just based on just faith here. It's factual evidence and works that we are spreading to the world here. And Jesus is basically saying that. Look at my works. Where do you think they're coming from? No, you broke the Sabbath. We're not looking at those works. We can't. You broke the Sabbath, our rules. And it's very sad, and they're the blind ones. They can't see that. So let's go back in the verse 16. Some Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he is a sinner and does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? So there was a division among them. So I'm giving the Pharisees a hard time right now. But there were some that were believing in Jesus. So they're not all blind. Okay? So give them a little credit right there. So... The works tell you about Jesus, and unless you refuse to look at the works, you're hooked on the Sabbath, okay? And then they ask the man, who do you think he is? And the blind man says, a prophet. But he doesn't say, the prophet. He's just a prophet, okay? So the man, the blind man's faith in Jesus is good, okay? But it's not developed to where it, it needs to be at this point. He knows Jesus is... He's, he's got to be at least a prophet. Okay? So they still aren't getting it. And what do they want from the man? Because the man isn't giving them 
what they want. The blind man is basically giving them, giving them faith and affirmative that Jesus is the Christ. And the Pharisees don't want to don't want to hear that. Okay. So what happens when your their unbelievers hear something that they don't want to hear? What do they do? They go and try to find evidence somewhere else. No, we got to find some. We got to hear something else. So let's see what they do. Verses eighteen through twenty-three. The Jews did not believe in him that he had been born, that he had been blind and had received his sight, until they called the parents of the very one who had received the sight and questioned them, saying, "Is this your son, who you say was born blind?" Then how does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him, he is of age. He'll speak on, his, on behalf of himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be the Christ, they're put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. Don't be talking to us right now. You know, talk to him. So we know they don't like what he was getting from his son or the blind man. So they go to the parents. We don't like what the blind man's telling us. Parents, what do you say? And I can see they're saying that with intimidation and looking down on them. You better tell us what we want to hear. But mostly the parents don't give them that much. They, they weren't there when he was healed. Okay? And they were afraid of the Pharisees. And John, the, auth the author, tells us very clearly that the parents are afraid of the Pharisees because they have the authority to put them out. Okay? You're kicked out of the synagogue if you proclaim Jesus as the Christ, okay? And that's like being cut off. If you're cut out of the synagogue back in that day, you're like being cut off from your people, okay? It's embarrassing. You know, your friends and family are going to be making fun of you, mocking you. You know, it's, it's, you're going to be the laughing stock, okay? So the parents don't want that to happen, okay? And they have to be honest, and they say, but yeah, that's our son, you know, we can't deny it, but we know that's him, okay? And we don't know how he was healed, just ask him, he's old enough, you know? Uh, the Pharisees don't want to go back to the man, okay? The parents aren't giving them enough evidence. So now, the Pharisees go back to the blind man to get something else out of him, and now let's look what the blind man says, and he stands up to them like no one else, okay? Look at this in verse 24 through 27. So a second time, the Pharisees bring the blind man out to them. And they say, give glory to God. We know that this man who healed, who healed you is a sinner. And the blind man answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. I do know that though I was blind, I now see. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered and told and told them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to be his disciples too, do you? Oh, so right there, they really he really ticked off the Pharisees right there, okay? Because they bring him back a second time, thinking they're gonna hear a different story from the blind man, okay? And they don't get that. And he's basically telling them, I told you already what happened. The whole story over again, okay? And look at the logic here in verse 27, or verse 25. The blind man answered, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I know, I was blind and now I see, okay? So it's either this illustration of one, either he is the blind man or he is not the blind man, or two, that he is the blind man. There, there's, those are the, basically the only two options that they have. And if he is the blind man, then he sees now. If they open that door, 
then they're going to have to say that Jesus is the Christ, but they won't open that door. They keep that door shut. So they're looking for another door. So they're trying to find some reason, reason to keep another door open, okay, with the blind man. So they're struggling, okay? But the man does not struggle, okay? He already knows that he's the man and he's healed. He's seen. And we're seeing the hardness of hearts of all the Pharisees right here, the real blind ones, okay? They refuse to admit that Jesus is the Christ, and he sees again. And they ask him a second time, how were you healed? And the blind man says, he spat on the ground and washed my eyes, I see again. So just like Jesus, he keeps telling them, okay, that he's the Christ, but they keep asking him over and over again, tell us plainly if you are or not, okay? So, the man gets bold and says, what, you guys want to become his disciples too? And now they are enraged, okay? 28 through 38. And they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, well, here is an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. When we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in Eton entirely in sins and you are teaching us so they put him out Jesus heard that he had put him out and finding him he said do you believe in the son of man he answered who is he Lord that I may believe in him and Jesus said to him you have both seen him and he is the one who is talking to you and the blind man said Lord I believe and he worshiped Jesus. So we can see because this mind, this this blind man, okay, has been given this new release on life. He was born blind and now he can see. He doesn't care about the Pharisees at this point. He basically told the Pharisees off right there. He he's not afraid of them. He doesn't care if he gets kicked out of the synagogue. He can see now. That's the last thing on his mind being kicked out of the synagogue. He has this beautiful sight of the world right here, okay? And notice as they're dealing with him, their answers, the Pharisees' answers and the Pharisees' comebacks are always an intimidation, or they're not using evidence. They're saying, you're his disciple, we're, we're, we're disciples of Moses. God talked to Moses. And it's just name calling and threats to this blind man from the Pharisees. So they say to the man who was uh, blind, you were born in sin. On how we uh, back to how we started this lesson you were born in sin and now you're blind okay and the Pharisees are aren't getting it because they don't want to open that door to Christ so they're scrambling the Pharisees now they are scrambling they're talking to each other they don't know what to do okay so they just finally kick them out okay and it's interesting that people like the parents are afraid of the Pharisees because they look at what they're going to lose, okay? But the man looks at what he's going to gain. And that's the way people have to choose. We have to look, we, people look at what they will lose or what they will gain in Jesus. And we have to look at what we're going to gain in Jesus and not what we're going to lose in this world with the Pharisees, okay? So the man has the right attitude and he's not afraid, but he knows that he's going to have that salvation through Jesus Christ. Okay? So Jesus finds him. And he goes to the man. And he says, it's me. You didn't see me before. All you could do is hear me, but now you hear me. And the man worshipped Jesus. And finally, his faith has developed now. From, no, Jesus is a prophet, and now Jesus is the Son of God to this blind man. And he just worships Jesus right there on the spot. 
just that relief of seeing the Son of God with your brand new eyes, okay, within the first 10, 20 minutes of your, you know, seeing the world. 39 to the end of the chapter. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Those Pharisees, those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, We are not blind too, are we? And Jesus said to him, If you were blind, would you have no sin? But since you say we see, your sin remains. So Jesus came for this very purpose, and he came for judgment, he says. But that's interesting because often Jesus says he doesn't come for judgment. Or he didn't come for judgment when he was here. But here he says he did come for judgment. And that here there is a purpose for his judgment here. So that they can see. Okay? And Jesus isn't talking about physically blind. He's talking about people like tax gatherers and sinners. Uh, because they are blind spiritually. And they can't see. And they're digging a hole for themselves deeper and deeper. Okay? But Jesus came to the world to become the light of the world and to be that light bulb that goes off for everybody. And Jesus also came that those who think they can see will remain blind because they don't understand spiritually. They think they can see and understand everything and know all about how to keep the Sabbath and how to keep their rules. But they're blind as a bat. So, Jesus, as long as you can see, you are going to be blind, spiritually blind, he's saying. You Pharisees think you can see everything, all your rules, but you do not see spiritually. And when you're spiritually blind, your sin remains. And if you're willing to help yourself and say, I am blind as a bat when it comes to spirituality, then Jesus can help you. Okay? Then you can see that Jesus is the light of the world. So we cannot be blind today, okay? We can all see. We see each other. We see the building. But we can't get wrapped up in all that. that, that that's all it's about, okay? Um, that's not all that matters right now. We are all seeing. We are all at seeing the truth. The spiritual truth. And that's the works of God through Jesus Christ. So today, does it take us a whole lot of evidence and this hearsay to believe? No. Okay? We are going to see the works and believe in it. We're not going to be spiritually blind like the Pharisees. Okay? So today, that's the end of my lesson. Thank you so much, John chapter 9. And today, if any of you need to strengthen your faith, in the Lord and Savior. Let that be known so you can see spiritually today. Thank you. Let's all stand and sing. Will you live for Jesus and be always pure?